sorrow, frustration or fulfillment, hope or desperation. In his time, each traveler comes to know the endless sensations that bless or plague his mind body, the vehicles in which he moves through life. But whenever sickness or injury has threatened that mind or body, man has always turned for help to the physician, the ultimate source of worldly healing. In ancient days, he turned through superstition and fear. Even in America, less than a century ago, medical care was a disgrace. Medicine's only forward strides were coming from small schools and laboratories of Europe. But today, in time of crisis, we turn to the American trained physician, not through fear or superstition or even desperation, but with firm confidence in the knowledge that his skill is unsurpassed anywhere in the world. Within our nation and within this century, there has come to pass a revolution in medicine. The genius of a handful of men who sparked that revolution is our story. Less than a hundred years ago, medical doctors in America were not required to have a college education. Some did not even attend medical school. And many of the so-called medical schools were not worthy of the name. Today, this young resident doctor is about to complete his formal medical training and begin his practice. Since graduating from college, his intensive medical education has taken nine long and arduous years. His challenge will be to help meet an appalling and ever-increasing need for medical care. But for that job, he is the best equipped, best informed, and most highly skilled doctor that the world of medicine has ever produced. The opportunity to become what he is, and the skills that he and all other young doctors today have perfected, are part of a legacy these young men and all of humanity owe to the vision, the selfless energy, and the untiring enthusiasm of a small group of superior men. But how did this American heritage of excellence begin? It began because there was a passionate need for it to begin, and because a wealthy bachelor with rare insight recognized that need. Out from the swirling mist of time, out of centuries of fear and superstition, the first real beginnings of medical science, the first medical revolution, if you will, began in Greece in the fifth century before Christ. Here Hippocrates, a young doctor who dared rebel against the age-old medical practices, laid the basic foundation of modern medicine. Here he taught that the doctor must first know what the disease is and what causes it before he can treat it. That the healer must love mankind first, if he is to love the art of healing. Many of his teachings and ethics are still followed today. Although the work of Hippocrates was a beginning, medical progress was painfully slow. In the second century AD, the Roman physician Galen amassed great volumes of observations about the human body and its care. It was not until 1400 years later that Paracelsus demolished the myths that cloaked Galen's often mistaken theories. And so with the great renaissance of learning, the progress of medical knowledge again surged forward. It was Vesalius at the University of Padua who gave the world its first really accurate picture of the human body, an anatomy text that has been called the greatest medical book ever written. Discovery of the microscope made possible Harvey's study of the circulation of the blood and Leeuwenhoek's discovery of body cells and bacteria in the 17th and 18th centuries. Once the cell theory was established in 1835, the pace of medical and scientific research began to speed up in Europe, especially in Germany. It was late in the 1800s that Louis Pasteur developed the germ theory of disease. By Pasteur's time, European medicine was heralded as the finest in the world, the need for research and the practical uses of scientific discovery were important factors for the growth of an industrial society. With industry had come wealth, a wealth that could support higher education. And so the continental schools flourished. 
In America, however, the contrast was shocking. Those who knew the condition called American medical education disgraceful. In 1860, Oliver Wendell Holmes had said, I firmly believe that if the whole materia medica as now used could be sunk to the bottom of the sea, it would be all the better for mankind and all the worse for the fishes. A few schools made struggling attempts to formalize graduate medical education, but with virtually no success. Across the country, hundreds of tiny so-called medical schools sprang up. To enroll, one needed only the price of admission. No college education was required. In fact, many were run by incompetent doctors or barbers who had learned from a previous generation of inadequately trained doctors or barbers. The sole purpose of many schools was to make money for the men who ran them. Anyone who bought enough tickets to the lectures could earn his degree. Many of these doctors graduated without ever having seen a living patient in all their training. Almost without exception, the only really good doctors at that time had taken at least part of their training abroad. The time was ripe for dramatic changes. Changes that would lift American medicine to a preeminent position in the world. The position it occupies today. In Baltimore, in the later decades of the 1800s, a fortunate combination of money and talent were to bring about those changes. Had these two factors never come together, America undoubtedly would have suffered through many years of agonizing medical evolution that might never have achieved the same amazing and far-reaching results. Instead, there occurred a sweeping and sudden revolution, which had an instantaneous and profound effect on the world. A revolution that was made possible by the actions of one man named Johns Hopkins. Hopkins, the son of Quaker tobacco growers, went to Baltimore at the age of 17 to work in the grocery business. He later moved into banking and railroading, and by his death had amassed the monumental sum of seven million dollars. He is quoted as having said that two things are sure to last. A university, for there will always be youth. A hospital, for there will always be suffering. Half his fortune he willed to build a new university the other half to build a new hospital. With unprecedented vision, his simple will set forth the general plan which provided for America's first true university, complete with its graduate medical school operating in combination with a teaching hospital and school of nursing. This was a plan unknown and untried in America. Within a few years, a brilliant gathering of great men fairly leaped at the opportunity and challenge to direct the future course of the institutions. Cornerstone of the system was Daniel Coit Gilman, who in 1874 left the presidency of the six-year-old University of California to become the first president of the newly founded Johns Hopkins University and also first director of the Johns Hopkins Hospital. Gilman established the Hopkins primarily as America's first graduate school with emphasis on graduate training enveloped in a research atmosphere. And the Hopkins University Medical School would usher in a new era when it was joined with a great teaching hospital, the pattern which today is the standard of medical education throughout the world. Even the design of the hospital building showed the same concern for excellence. Army surgeon John Shaw Billings, another man of vision, spent 13 years in completing the hospital during which time he studied the best features of the finest hospitals at home and abroad. The line of exceptional men didn't stop with Gilman and Billings, for the spark that made the promise of medical revolution a reality was the succession of remarkable doctors who soon were drawn to the Hopkins, a driving force that brought about that fresh, new kind of thinking that determined the future shape and direction of all medical education in this country. The key to the success of the Hopkins story is found, at least in part, in the fact that from the beginning it was all new. Bright young men with a bright new vision in bright new buildings. Here there were no ancient traditions to overcome, no special interests to satisfy. Here had been born almost overnight the greatest opportunity and the greatest freedom that American medicine was ever to know. Scientific discovery in the 19th century had brought pathology, 
study of disease and what it does to the body, to new heights. In Germany, the strong emphasis on scientific research in medicine had made possible great advances in this field. The first faculty member to be chosen by Gilman and Billings was a pathologist, Dr. William H. Welch. Steeped in the German medical tradition, Welch had been disappointed that New York City hospitals lacked an interest in research. Despite dire warnings by New York friends that he would be throwing away his career in the oblivion of Baltimore, Welch was determined to accept the offer. He wrote to a friend, no place in America offers the real opportunity for scientific work which this does. It seems to me that it is an opportunity for giving a start and impetus to the spirit of real scientific work, which is thus far so sadly lacking on this side of the Atlantic, which can come to a man only once in a lifetime. There was opportunity, and Welch would make the most of it. In his own time, he was to become a living legend, known throughout the world as the Dean of American Medicine, and to his devoted colleagues as Popsley Welch. Dr. Welch's pathology laboratory was the nucleus from which the institutions were to grow, and his spirit of research soon became the high spirit of the hospital. Welch attracted many brilliant men to Hopkins, but none more important than the second faculty member, Professor William Osler, physician in chief of the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Osler, a Canadian, was as richly steeped in the traditions and theory of British medicine as Welch was in the German. Probably nothing did more to fashion the new style of American medical education than the joining of the German and English systems through the most fortunate association of Welch and Osler. This pattern of scientific research combined with careful patient observation and bedside teaching became the foundation for the study program of nearly every American medical school. Osler was renowned for many important new ideas, but he always said that he most wanted to be remembered as the man who opened the hospital wards to the students. From Osler's inspiration came the present day practice of small groups taught at the bedside and emphasis on the sensitive handling of patients. Among the other great figures Welch attracted to Johns Hopkins was Dr. William S. Halstead. Halstead literally founded a new school of surgery that produced many of the world's most highly skilled surgeons and established principles and practices that even now remain a major influence on every surgeon who enters an operating room. The electricity of what was happening in Baltimore spread and the name Johns Hopkins was famous the world around long before the hospital finally opened its doors in 1889. Another Philadelphian, Dr. Howard A. Kelly, soon was invited to become gynecologist in chief and obstetrician to the hospital. Kelly was a brilliant surgeon whose performance in the operating room was breathtaking and his principles of caring for patients and for teaching were close to those held by Osler, Halsted and Welch. The excitement that the sparkling association of these four men brought to academic medicine was made even greater by still other outstanding men who found themselves drawn to Hopkins and by a long and illustrious list of exceptional students, many of whom joined their teachers to form a veritable who's who of medicine. In 1893, four years after the hospital had been firmly established, the university opened its medical school. From the very outset, the school was revolutionary. Medical schools traditionally had picked their faculties from among local physicians, so there was great controversy in the Baltimore Medical Society when Johns Hopkins began to choose the rest of its faculty from the outside, just as it had with Welch, Osler, Halsted, and Kelly. But with money no problem, the best men were brought from wherever they could be found. To work beside the medical doctors in the school were key men from the university campus, professors of the basic sciences, non-medical scholars who were to help develop medicine as a science. And so began one of the most exciting periods in the history of medical education, research, and scientific advancement for the relief of human suffering. From the very beginning, the story of the Johns Hopkins Medical Institutions has been one of firsts. Every student who studies here feels a burning pride in the knowledge that this was the first American medical school to require a bachelor's degree as a requirement for entrance. 
The first major school to accept both men and women as students. The first to provide a staff of doctors whose full time was devoted to teaching and research. One of the first to require a four-year course of study and the first to admit students to the hospital wards. The standards of excellence were so high when the school opened that Osler is said to Welch, we were lucky to get in as professors, for I'm sure that neither you nor I would ever get in as students. Today, the medical institutions are still dedicated to the basic teachings of that memorable era when it all began here at Hopkins. Here, it is not enough merely to pass knowledge on to the next generation. The faculty must add to the total body of knowledge by research, observation, and experiment. In 1902, in that spirit, Dr. Frederick Bacher accepted an appointment to head what grew to become the Department of Radiological Science. For more than 30 years, he labored. As Dr. Alan Chesney, his colleague and former dean of the medical school, was to write, Bacher was one of that band of pioneers in the field who paid dearly for the knowledge which they gained. That he had the misfortune to lose an eye and was obliged to undergo many palliative operations, more than a hundred it is said, as a result of his exposure to x-rays before their danger was understood, never seemed to alter in any way his jovial disposition, and certainly did not affect his devotion to his special field. Dr. Bacher died, but his department continued to grow and new talented men carried forward the work. In 1951, Dr. Russell A. Morgan, attempting to reduce the amount of radiation the patient must receive, developed a television system that could brighten the fluoroscope screen 50,000 times. This, in turn, enabled development of the first practical method of making motion pictures using X-ray. Today, the study of motion pictures of the heart in action has become an important tool in cardiac research. When observations from the films are analyzed and fed into the medical center's electronic computer, each new case is compared with the scores of cases that have gone before, and the emerging patterns already are helping to better understand the nature of heart disease. This same kind of chain reaction made possible many similar important discoveries in all other departments of the Hopkins, each research project benefiting from the hundreds of others going on throughout the hospital and school. Among these have been the purification of insulin, the great weapon against diabetes, discovery of adrenaline, of the blood clotting agent, heparin, of vitamins A and D, the development of Dramamine, and of Mercurochrome, discovery of the cause and cure of rickets, the invention of closed chest heart massage, development of the famous blue baby operation, which opened up the whole field of heart surgery. Verification of the three strains of polio virus, which made possible the development of the Salk vaccine, and countless others, all indebted to the scientific spirit which has blessed the Hopkins since the days of Popsy Welch and his associates. Probably nothing at Hopkins has kept this great spirit of research alive as has the full-time system for the faculty. The system which originated here provides that the doctors who are chiefs of hospital services and also professors in the medical school all work full-time on a university salary. They have no private patients of their own and the fees that are collected when they serve as consultants are returned to the university. But these men who teach have their own laboratories and the time to use them. This was a major step in integrating the University School of Medicine with the hospital. And the plan has been adopted to some degree by most other schools as having incalculable benefits for both clinical research and teaching. From the beginning, Hopkins graduates have been an important force in spreading the spirit of the medical institutions to other schools and to other countries. In many foreign countries, the name Baltimore has come to mean Johns Hopkins. And more often than not, the Johns Hopkins School of Hygiene and Public Health, which along with the medical school and hospital, comprises the Johns Hopkins Medical Institutions. The pioneer in graduate medical education, Hopkins has become one of the world's greatest centers for postgraduate work. 
Here, nearly twice as many doctors continue to study after having received their degrees as those still working for their MDs. Today, with the exploding world population, the shortage of trained doctors is an international problem. And nearly a third of the post-doctoral staff at Hopkins have come from other countries. Recognizing that America cannot train enough doctors to meet the needs of the world, the Hopkins is extending its traditions abroad by helping selected foreign medical schools develop into centers for training medical educators. This program is operating in three areas of the world with the most dire need. In South America, the University of Medical and Biological Sciences at Lima, Peru. In Central Africa, at the University of Ibadan, Nigeria. And in the Middle East, the American University of Beirut, Lebanon, in the heart of the Muslim world. Besides the exchange of Hopkins faculty members, a dozen of the most promising junior staff members from those schools are brought to Hopkins for several years of intensive work. Part of the post-doctoral work today is the residency system which was inspired by Dr. Osler and begun here early in the century. The program of graduated responsibility and training for the resident doctor laid the foundation for true specialization in medicine and is used by nearly every teaching hospital in America. Under the system, selected doctors, having completed their four years of medical school and a rigorous year of internship, continue on for several more years at the hospital working under specialists in their chosen field, but surrounded by the combined experiences of a great general teaching hospital. For some, the training may seem nearly endless. This young surgeon has just completed seven years as a resident in surgery. Now he will go on for another two years to specialize in the surgery of children. When he finally leaves to teach or to practice, he will have been in intensive medical training for 14 years since graduating from college, a total of 30 years of education, a very long time. But his exceptional skill in pediatric surgery will prove its worth many times over in the expressions of grateful parents whose children's lives have been saved, or whose suffering or deformity has been relieved through the skills he developed as a resident. Most residents will study only for three or four years in order to become expert in their own fields. Of growing importance among these are the specialists in internal medicine, doctors who achieve great skill at diagnosing disease and the cause of disease. Such a residency training program with added experience in psychiatry, pediatrics and preventive medicine will produce a new specialist who working mainly in a hospital or a small clinic eventually will take the place of the general practitioner or old family doctor. If this new family physician cannot treat the disease himself, he is trained to know the best person who can. This new program recognizes the need for medical care is greater than ever before, and that most young doctors are going into some kind of specialization. In an age when overwhelming scientific development might cause some to lose sight of the patient, it is important to realize that with all of its research, the patient has always remained uppermost at the Hopkins. Even today, the heritage that was for doctors is felt everywhere. And it was Osler who said that medicine should begin with the patient, continue with the patient, and end with the patient. The manner of caring for the patient may change, but for Hopkins doctors, the well-being of each patient is the main concern. The problems of modern medicine are mounting and infinitely complicated. They will only be met by the finest doctors who can be found. Today, those doctors are trained in America. They are heirs to the Johns Hopkins Revolution, a revolution without end. It continues here today and in all the schools which share in the heritage of excellence it began in the classrooms, laboratories, clinics, operating rooms, and even the hallways of the Hopkins.